For those who know Westminster Seminary, California, um, there are two events in the academic year that everyone looks forward to. The first one is the new student reception, which takes place the night before the first day of classes. It's when all the first year students gather with their families and they introduce themselves to the Westminster family. We often hear of how the Lord called them and moved mountains to actually bring them here. It's a special occasion for us to get to know them a little bit better. The second event that everyone looks forward to is called the graduation reception. And that actually takes place the night before the commencement. So it would have taken place last night were we to hold it. It's when the graduates gather together A number of them speak on behalf of their class, sharing about their experiences on campus, their studies, and also relate to us where they're headed and where the Lord is leading them. It's often funny, it's very moving, it's very convicting for many of us who are there. It's a family moment for us as Westminster family, and we cherish those moments. Well, on that night, ordinarily, I, as president, have the responsibility of bringing the charge to the students, the last time we have a chance to speak to one another. And this morning, we're bringing that charge to you. We're mixing elements of the graduation reception and the commencement together. And for our graduating seniors, unfortunately, sorry, brothers and sisters, you won't have a noted speaker here speaking to you today for your commencement. But I am delighted And it's my great privilege to bring you this final word as we launch you into the world to Christ's service. Every class is special. Um, We have lots of memories about what we learned in class and the interactions that we've had. I have a lot of memories about students and their families as we run into each other on campus. And every class has that one quirky, funny student that always stands out in your mind. I won't mention that his name is Caleb Friends in this class. But as we think about this class, this is a special one for a lot of different reasons. Um, It's the first class that mostly lived in the village that we completed and moved into a couple years back. It's the class that I became president uh, during their stays here and stay here as well as their studies. It's the class that saw for the first time an online component to uh, Westminster Seminary, California, a school so dedicated to residential education. I was reflecting upon this class last night and I also remembered uh, that there are a lot of uh, second generation graduates here. What I mean by that is you have Isaac Ball, who is the son of Dr. Steve Ball, who not only graduated from here, but has taught here for many years. You have Eric Johnson, who's the son of our retired professor, my professor, Dennis Johnson, who after many years of studying here in between his ministry abroad, is able to complete his degree today. And then we have a student named Calvin Kim who's graduating, whose father was my classmate when I was in seminary during the 90s. For me, these are indications of the Lord's blessings upon us and our campus, and we're so delighted that they're here We look forward to seeing how the Lord uses them and their classmates in the world as they spread out from here. Well, this morning, as we think about our ministry and our direction, I want to leave you with the words that we read earlier in Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul was certainly a first-rate theologian, friends, and you know that well. And he was a relentless evangelist and a prolific writer but he was first and foremost a pastor. Throughout the book of Romans, Paul's exposition of theology is followed closely by application that naturally leads to doxology, worship, as we come before the Lord. As John Stott rightly states, there is something fundamentally flawed about a purely academic interest in God. God is not an appropriate object for cool, critical, detached, scientific observation and evaluation. No, the true knowledge of God will always lead us to worship as it did Paul. Our place is on our faces before him in adoration. In Romans 5, we see Paul at work as a pastor, pastoring the congregation to reflect deeply and practically about his teachings. 
So this morning, I want to briefly approach this pass, passage under two headings, justified and blessed. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, Romans 5 hangs on these eight words. Actually, in the original, these are four words in Greek. These words summarize his teachings thus far and establish what he's about to explain going forward. For you see, friends, in Romans 1 through 4, Paul clearly laid out a global problem. We are all sinners and we live in sin. Paul summarizes it this way in chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He further says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Even before this global pandemic, we were faced with a universal problem of another kind, sin and sin in us. You see Paul not speaking in generalities. He brings this home by speaking specifics about our own sinfulness. This is helpfully summarized for us in the paragraph following the text that we read. For in verse 6, we are told we were weak, unable and unwilling to master the temptations of our flesh. In verse 6 again, we were told we were ungodly, corrupt in our nature as we willingly exchange God for something else for satisfaction and security. Ultimately, we were sinners, we're told in verse 8, inclined towards sin in active rebellion against the perfection and righteousness of God. You know this well. Many of you have studied Romans very carefully. But the answer comes in the form of Jesus. But Jesus takes place in the book of Romans. God's rescue plan involved the sending of his only begotten son. And in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord, he justified us, forgiving us our sins and declaring us righteous on account of Christ Jesus. In fact, our present passage is enveloped by the justifying death of Jesus, where in chapter 4, verse 24 and following, we're told our righteousness will be counted to us. That is, Christ's righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And verse 8 picks this up again when he says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you and me. Friends, as newly minted masters, that sounds grandiose, doesn't it? Masters in theology and divinity, this truth may be too simple for you, too often heard. But let me remind it to us again. More important than your degrees, more important than your title as pastors or teachers, more important than anything else you do in life going forward, remember who you are in Christ Jesus. Because of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, declared righteous by Christ Jesus, called sons and daughters of the God Most High, and you belong to him. Remember the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer number one? What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, your value and your significance are based on the very fact that you belong to him. The world says you're valuable because of your degrees, your successes in ministry, or recognition on the internet. But God simply says that you're valuable simply and wholly because you belong to Jesus Christ. You are justified in Christ Jesus, never forget it. At the same time, not only are we justified, we are also blessed. Paul spoke of the blessings of justification in Romans 4, 6, blessings of justification, and now he explains to us about the blissful consequences, as one commentator says, of our justification. How are we blessed by our justification? First, in verse 1 of our passage, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. What does Paul mean by peace? Often we assume that peace is primarily a subjective feeling. 
It is well with my soul, the song says, sense of personal well-being. And I know that many of us would desire that even now. Certainly, Paul does speak of this subjective and inner peace, often referring to it as the peace from God. And we see this in places like Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But in this verse, Paul speaks of something more fundamental than our sense of well-being. He speaks of peace with God a change in status in our relationship with God, no longer enemies, compared to verse 10, who rebelled against God and deserved his wrath, we are now reconciled to God and are favored by God through our Lord Jesus Christ. From being called weak, ungodly, sinner, and enemies, all the words found in Romans chapter five, we now have in our present possession, not a future reality, not a perhaps and a maybe, but we now have a newfound status as sons and daughters of God in Christ Jesus. This is why Romans 8, 14 is able to say with confidence, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We have peace with God. But one of the blessings of justification is not just peace, but we also have access to God by faith. We have access to God, not on our own merits. After all, it is through Christ, we are told, we have been given access into the very presence of God. Ephesians 3.12 reminds us of this when it says, Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Christ. This is not a temporary, or periodic access to God, like we would envision an audience with someone who's famous around us, someone who is important and powerful. No, no, our relationship with God, our God most high, the creator and redeemer of the whole earth is not provisional nor probationary. It's not temporary or sporadic. It is secure and permanent. Like a child having access into his father's study without hindrance or fear. And let me tell you, our children access my study without discrimination every single day. How many Zoom calls have I had where I had family members running behind me? And perhaps you've experienced that as well. They're able to do that because their relationship with me is not in doubt. Here we are told, like having access to our Father, we now have unfettered access with confidence into the very presence of God. We are indeed blessed. We have peace with God. We have access to the Father. But one thing that this passage emphasizes for us is the fact that we have hope. We have hope of the glory of God. Hope is mentioned three times in these short verses. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, verse two says, and it ends with, and hope does not put us to shame in verse five. It's not wishful thinking or a simple fleeting desire. This hope means that we have joyful confidence in our future. What he has in mind is eschatological glory, the final day glory. The promise to us is that there is nothing in this world that is not intended by God to assist us on our earthly pilgrimage and to bring us safely and certainly to the glorious destination of that pilgrimage. In other words, our Father in heaven in Christ Jesus will one day bring us home. Our place there in his home is secure. God who declared us righteous in Christ Jesus, Jesus will not and cannot change his mind, making the promised glory certain and definite for us. But it's not only about that promise that's certain. It's also that this hope gives us a joyful confidence 
in our present. Paul seems to have known that the mention of the future hope of glory would seem so distant and so out of place for many who see the dark circumstances around them. And perhaps you and I recognize that as well. As chapter 8, verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time. For you see, Paul was a realist. Um, Paul certainly has in mind and recognized the sufferings of this present age. We witness sufferings, whether from weak and weakening bodies, disease, diseases known and unknown, broken relationships and families, and struggles through daily uncertainties of life. We realize daily that this is not our home, and this is not the way it's supposed to be. But sufferings also include, and Paul has in mind, the sufferings that accompany faith and faithfulness. Paul often speaks of sufferings that accompany faith, what he calls sufferings with Christ. This shouldn't surprise us by any means, given that the New Testament authors regularly remind us what John says so pointedly when he says in 1 John 3, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. This is part of the reason why we as faculty feel bittersweet about launching our students. Sweet in the sense that the front lines of our churches will be re reloaded with many of our brothers and sisters who are going. Bitter in the sense that we know that in many ways the challenges are great and they're heading right into it. This means, friends, when days are dark and providence frowns upon us, we still can have confidence because of God. Here, he matures us through the suffering, as verses 3 and 4 say, knowing that sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. We can also have joyful confidence because the promise is, in the midst of those sufferings, he is there with us, as verse 5 says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts guaranteeing us. This is because our God is the God of hope, Paul declares in Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Notice what he says again. May the God of hope, God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Friends, you are justified. You are blessed because you have peace with God in Christ Jesus. You have access to our Father in heaven because of Jesus, and you have hope. Hope that comes from the God of hope that is unrelenting, and that cannot be changed. You are justified and blessed. Friends, proclaiming this is your ministry. Frankly, to lift the name of Christ Jesus on high to those who, are, who do not know him, who are dying apart from him. To remind believers of how blessed we are in Christ Jesus, that we're made right with God because of Jesus Christ our Lord. And to bring hope Hope to all who struggle with the present and who are uncertain about their future. One of the pastors told me recently, given all the changes that are occurring around us, that this is such an important time for ministers and pastors, and we believe it. And we are so grateful that the Lord has prepared you to launch you into these churches so that you may remind them of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, the hope that the God of hope provides for us. So friends, class of 2020, congratulations. We are so grateful for you, and we will be praying for you. You will be remembered, and we pray the Lord's blessings upon you. So may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord shine his face upon you as, begin, as, as you begin your lifelong journey of serving Christ and his gospel and the church. Thank you.